So first of all, how many of you use Docker at the moment? Oh, not too bad. Six months ago were many less people. So you may know that it takes months that you're planning some things, you think that it's ready, then you go to production, and you, you don't fear that actually something may get wrong. You know that that will happen. You don't know when, but you know that something wrong will happen. So actually, that's why we are using, we, are look, we look to uh, Docker, why we want to look at it. So before starting with the, the Docker tool, let's just speak a little bit about me, uh, but just a little bit. Uh, today, we will see an exercise, uh, so something that we, you can run, actually. We will see where Docker is useful and why, uh, why using Docker. Um, I first met Docker three years ago, more or less, because I was working on a project, and actually something that were, uh, looked interested, uh, interesting we, uh, were using Docker. Actually, it was not working, so I had to uh, put my hands on these things and fix it. At the end, it worked, but we decided not to use that product, but it, it was fine because I started looking at <coughs> Docker, and then I had the chance to, to use it. Uh, the, the problem, the first problem that I saw using Docker is that, um, to implement Docker, actually, there were a lot of uh, work workplaces are using Agile. How many of you are using Agile? Wow, less people. Less people than using Docker. That's awesome. Uh, the problem with Agile, th those that don't know often, is that the environment is not really Agile. So uh, most people just use that, touch that label, say, OK, we are, yes, we are Agile, but actually you are not. So things taking a lot of time to go from development to production. Uh, usually I expect in an Agile environment to go from development to production a few minutes later. Uh, hopefully you have thousands of tests uh, that will prove that you are not making any mistake, you are not stopping your uh, company, you are not making a, a huge, huge issue. Uh, if you are still living in an environment where either you are calling agile or not, but still you have to spend a lot of time from development to, to production, and then you have a lot of, you, may, you face a lot of issues or things that are supposed to work, sadly doesn't work, because maybe the configuration in production is different from what is in your dev machine or what is in QA, or if you are lucky to have also another environment to test with the, 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 the data, the actual, actual uh, data. So sometimes that is the issue. And the operator may say, you, oh, yeah, yeah, we are using less memory or more memory or more CPU, or we are not using the same uh, oper operative system. So, oh, yeah, we need more features, more libraries, we have to do some things, we stop these things. You all know that this, uh, this is a nightmare, actually. That's my nightmare that I, I used to, to live times ago before I work with uh, Docker. Well, most of, uh, the first thing that I see, I saw with Docker is, well, trying to use Docker, actually, is you saw the title is using microservices, but most of the time you are not that lucky to have a microservice to put in production, but you are working with a monolith. Uh, so probably seems to be a pain in the ass to, to get something working in Docker, and actually that is. Uh, the best suggestion would be go to microservices. Everybody would like to do that, but you, you will all, we all know that's not always possible. That's not true, actually. It is possible. Takes time, takes some efforts, but we can go there. How to go there? We can see something today. Um, when you are working with the monolith, actually, you either w had needs, well, you need a lot of CPU and a lot of, a lot of memory to run it. Uh, how many of you have machines that have many CPU and infinite memory? <laughs> wow, you. <laughs> OK, lucky you. <laughs> uh, that's not the common situation. So often, we have to find the balance between CPU and memory. That's hard to explain to the other stakeholders, look, we need more memory, more CPU. So that's why instead of working with the monolith, we try to split the application in services. So maybe we can run something, some part of the application that is using a lot of CPU on a machine that is, has a lot of CPU but less memory, and vice versa. We can have more memory where we need it. So actually, we can save some money and we can achieve what we want. That's hard to do with the monolith because we, we all have everything together. Uh, so uh, what, we, what I learned is that one size does not fit all. We want, I like to have small machines that may do 
quick calculation, and then other machine that can have a lot of space or memory to store the data, that's fine. We can achieve that with some microservices, and Docker helps us. Uh, the thing, the difference, the first difference for me when I approached to Docker, where I used to work a lot with virtualization. It was fine. Uh, it was cool in my situation because I had to work with a lot of different systems, um, languages, and also operative system. So you know, it's a lot of differences. I, I would have loved to have a thousand machines to try all the stuff on them. Probably not enough space, but virtualization was my situation. So um, I guess that all of you know the virtualization, but I just want to go through the how virtualization is made, because then we will see a difference with Docker, and we can appreciate, appreciate that difference. So actually, with the virtualization, we have um, a hardware where we are just installing uh, our system as usual, but then we have to install another application that is our virtualization. On top of that virtualization, what we are putting? Well, you know, yeah, that's true. But if, if, if you can see, we have two systems. And how many times we, the, those two systems are the same one? So to me, it looks like uh, a waste of resources, CPU and memory. So that's not the best approach. But if you don't have it, if I have another situation, come on, that's the only situation, the only uh, solution that we have. Then on top of our system, we are installing all the application that we need. On a, with application, I also mean libraries. And you know, if you have 1,000 servers, then you have to do the same steps on all of them. There are very few situations, very few workplaces where all these steps are automated. And then you, when you need something, you just click a, a button, and you get the full machine up and running in a few seconds. Maybe you guys have it. Like, I don't know, but I would like to, to have that one. So what is the difference with Docker, actually? Because uh, we are doing almost the same things. We have hardware. Yes, we need hardware. We have system, operating system. Yes, we have it. But then here we, we see the difference. We have Docker. Maybe somebody can say, oh, look, but this is the same thing as virtualization. What is the difference? That we are not installing an operative system on top of Docker. We are installing images. OK, come on. Images may be the same things, because all of us use ISO to install the, the system on virtualization. Is it the same things? More or less. Actually, it's not. There is a huge difference. Why? Because have you seen these layers, actually? Here, we are working on layers. We are using the same approach that Docker is using to deploy and work. Docker is using, actually, layers. So an image, actually, is a stack of layers that are doing some common things. So when I'm then building something else, that when I'm running my application, in Docker, we say that we are running a container. So the same uh, image may be used by many containers. That means many applications. What is the benefit? That I have to build an image once, but then I can run 100 containers using the same uh, libraries, exactly the same ones. So actually, here we go to a one push, one button, and we get, can get an application running the same libraries, same dependencies, exactly the same things with the same version of the, the system. On our dev machine, once we have the image, we can just send the image to all other people or other stakeholders interested in our application, and they can run it with a simple command. Actually, we can run, we can have a batch command, we can have uh, continuous integration, we can we can have a continuous develop deployment. All these things work. How much work we have to put on that? Yes, actually, we have to work on the image. We must be sure that the image is working and suits our needs. If that image suits our needs, it will switch in production as well. Yeah, I know. All of you heard these things. Yeah, yeah, it's working on my machine. That is not working on my teammate. It's not working in production. So where is the error? Well, it's, my machine is working. That was the scenario that we used to live before Docker. Actually, right now, when I say that the image is working on my computer, the image is working on her computer, the image is working on his computer, just because the image is immutable. The difference is in the container. So the container actually is a running image. Of course, there are data that are different. Of course, there may be wrong data. There may be um, some dependency that is outside our image that is broken. That stage, I would say, yes, you may not have run many tests. But I can say you that the problem is not image itself. 
is something else. Actually, that helps my work, because now I know that I have to look somewhere else. So maybe, yes, configuration may be different, but we don't care anymore, because we know that image is the same. So the software that is running is exactly the same. Nothing else has changed. Something outside our container? Yeah, OK. That's where we can start looking at. So if you can see, using the same resources, the, well, getting the same results, we can use much less resources. What is the benefit of this? That actually we can, use, we can run many machines, many applications on the same hardware, or we can run different applications on the same hardware. So if you can see, now we can get to clo closer to microservices, just because we can split, starting splitting our application. Of course, something I myself start with Monolith as the first service. That's fine. That was the monolith that was the proof of concept to show to the company, look, this is doable, actually doable. And it's not taking months or years. It's doable now. So something that you used to run, to take a lot of time to run, now can run in very short time, uh, often in seconds instead of minutes. And I can test it, actually. If it's working on my machine, it's going to work on your machine as well. I have no issue. What is the, the things that we? We'll need, actually. Uh, luckily, we don't have any more floppy, or hopefully you're not using CD to pass your codes. So we need some uh, your application. So we need some way to share the image that I'm building, because otherwise, it's going to be different. Or maybe there could be some issues. Luckily, you're not using USB sticks to, to go in production. Please don't tell me that you're doing that. Um, that was my monolith the one that we saw at the beginning. And now we are starting split, uh, splitting it. How? We build them. We take some functionality. We move out of the, con the application. We can test it with the monolith and other services. Is it working? Cool. We have an image that is working. We can go in production and starting splitting and uh, reducing our my monolith. It's not working. Cool. We know that the problem is with the image. So we can work on the image. We can do a lot of it test iteration and integration tests. And once it's working, we can start dividing our monolith. One thing that I f often found with uh, starting with, uh, with people that didn't use Docker were that they were asking a lot of stuff. So uh, you know your image is doing uh, some task. Can we have another task in that uh, image? Can we have another task with that image? And somebody else said, oh, look, I need to do some check. Could you put into your image? So that image actually is becoming a fat image with a lot of features, a lot of services. Uh, um, and to me, that actually seems like, uh, uh, looks like monolith again. But we don't want monolith. We want microservices. So the smallest, the better. If it breaks, we know that that light, little tiny thing is broken. But, and we can fix that one. We can upgrade that one. If we have more services, then we don't know which one failed. And if one failed in, in one image, maybe it's going to stop other stuff. And then we don't want that thing. Actually, we want to split. I want to know that if I'm upgrading something and tests are still uh, successful, it will work without any impact. So on top of, the, of our system, we are building some custom customization. What does that mean in Docker? That we are building other images. So let's see an example that I will show you in a, in a few minutes. I'm going to start with a, a system with some libraries that we need. Uh, I mainly develop in Java. So I will, I will build another layer that contains Java. So usually on, on top of Java, you use either an application server or a serverless container, maybe anything else, but usually those are the two main components. So I'm building a microservice that is running my application service. Uh, nowadays, there are services that are ready. So you don't have to build anything. You just start from the service, and that's fine. Then you, what you have to do, either deploy your ear application, your file, or the work file, and it will work. That's fine. So on top of that application.image, we can put 
all the application that the company is working, all those application actually are services. But look, do we have only one single application? So do we, do, can I use that Java layer only for a single stuff? Actually not. I can have whatever I want. So on top of Java, I can install whatever service I want. I may not have service. Maybe it's just an applica Java application. I don't need the service. That's cool. I can just have it. How are we building this stuff? How are we telling Docker what to do? Actually, Docker use a Docker file called Docker file, capital D. So in that file, we are just writing the instruction what Docker should do, how to build the image, and then we will see how to run that image. First things usually is which operating system we are using. In my case, I decide to use Ubuntu 16. You can decide whatever. Just a guess. If I want to use, for example, Ubuntu 14, what I have to change in my configuration? It's just one line of code. Luckily, somebody else built an image for Ubuntu. That's cool. But that's the thing, same thing. So what, I, what that means is that I can test my application with different systems, just changing some things. There is a tricky part of that, and we will see that later. But if you want, if your uh, company says, look, we don't want to use Ubuntu 16. Uh, we need to use uh, 18 or CentOS. That's fine. You just ch change that thing, and then you will run, be running on another system. Of course, there will be some differences, uh, but it's easy. Uh, in my case, actually, I build a system, an image, that contains my system. So I have some customization. I don't want to reply them all, all the time. So I have a system that is based on Ubuntu, and I'm using that, that image as the bottom image for all other systems. I want to run some, some things. So probably you have run some bash script when you are configuring your image. Actually, with run command from uh, Docker, you're doing the same stuff. Actually, the only difference is that now we have to put the run, uh, run uh, command, that is Docker command. I usually use the, the co Docker commands in capital letters because then it is, it's easy to, to, spoke that, to scope them. Uh, so what I'm doing, uh, let's see easy even, I'm just updating the, the system and installing some, some applications. But what I'm doing at the bottom, I'm also cleaning my APT cache. Uh, why I'm doing that? Because Docker, every time that build an image, store whatever it's you did in that image, so all the software that you downloaded or you compiled in that image. If you are then using another image that is built on your top of that image, you are carrying on a lot of information that probably you don't want. So you are just moving more data that probably you don't want. So what I'm doing here is cleaning the cache. Why am I using this structure instead of running different runs commands? Because Docker runs them all in sequence, because it's just bash command, but has a single layer. That means that I will get the updates, I will install the application that I need, and I will delete all the metadata and all the binary that I downloaded, that, well, actually Docker downloaded, that I don't need anymore. That is saving space. Of course, if I have to run to install something else, I will have to run through those commands. It's all right, but then if you know that uh, in a couple of months you want to install something else, probably most dependencies has changed. When you are building an image, you are, the image is immutable, so you are not supposed to change it soon. Unless there are some upgrades, that's fine. Then I want to run Java, so I will run a command like that one. Anybody disagree on that command? Cool. Actually, that command does work. Because uh, do, um, Oracle asks you to accept the license, but Docker is all automatic things. So you don't have any input. You cannot click OK. So unfortunately, you have to do in a different way. Um, there are some images that already Oracle now is shipping an image that contains Java. That's cool. You may use it doesn't switch my needs, so I have to build an image with Java myself. Those are all the commands that I have to, to run to be able to, insta to install Java 8 on my system. 
it took me some time to get there. But when I found them all, it was cool. Uh, it's working, so the, the most important things. And now I can swap from Java 8, 9, or 7, or whatever. It's very easy. Actually, the major that I'm running is using uh, some variables, because I don't want to type 8, 9, 10, 7 to change them. So just using an image to build the image that I want. But they work. I'm setting the, the environment. You can set whatever you need, whatever you want. Now, we are at the bottom, at the end of our image, more or less. What I want to, what I need now, is to run the application. So I'm copying the application. In this case, is a jar file somewhere. You decide where. Uh, so this is a service. Can be the application. You know, different scenarios, different packages, but doesn't change. I'll show you, uh, the network here is not very fast. So I'll show you an image that, uh, a video that I recorded that is doing, is running those commands. Uh, but you can run them yourself, and you will get the same output. Uh, so actually, OK. What I'm doing here, if you see, I'm uh, running a registry. This is the Docker registry. This is the way that we can share our images with other people. So others can connect to port 80 of my service and get the image that they want. How can you, they can do that? Using a command that is docker pool. The docker pool will just pull the image that you, you built. Some parts of the image, let's see, yeah. So we have the name of the, the image that you, the, the container that you want. So it's registered in our case. And then what is the image name? The image name is composed by two parts. There is the name, actually, and the version. If you do not specify the version, Docker use latest tag. That means whatever the dever developer or whoever, whoever build the image is latest. Usually, it's actually latest. Uh, let's see our application, uh, our example. So for our example, I'm using Spring Boot. Uh, I like it. It's easy. Uh, does a lot of stuff of works. I'm um, using those packages, those dependencies from Spring Boot to show you what we are doing. I'm using logback uh, to our log. There's nothing more, nothing more to say. I'm using Jackson. I'm using, that's where I want to stop a little. I'm using a package library called Metadata Extractor uh, because it's uh, somebody, a uh, good guy, built that image. That, that, sorry, that, uh, that library that is doing the job that I want. So I actually just had to add this dependency. How to do that? For, our, for my build, I'm using Gradle. So to do that, I just specify those data. How many of you do, uh, know so use Gradle and Groovy? OK, not that many. Uh, so the difference with, between Gradle and Maven, I guess the most of the, you are using Maven, is that we, uh, Gr uh, Gradle is using Groovy. Uh, this uh, uh, J uh, JVM dialect, it's uh, less, mm, bit more clear. No, you cannot use, you may not use uh, semicolons, it's up to you. Um, instead of using XML as you do in Maven, you are just doing like plain uh, text. So actually, the, 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 data, the metadata are the same. So there is a group, that is the domain name. There is a name that actually is the application, and then there is the version. Not that complicated. The example that we will see are in Groovy and Gradle, but doesn't make most different, much different. Most of the time, in the example, to convert from Groovy to Java, I just adding columns, semicolons at the end of your line, and that will work unless you are using some different difference. What I'm doing with that metadata, actually, I'm it's Spring, so Spring Boot. I'm defining. Uh, mapping for uh, my REST API application. I'm saying that it's a controller. Those stuff are all Spring stuff. How many of you do not use Spring? OK. Um, not that many. That's good. What I'm defining that I would want just to have more control is that the, uh, the method and then what are the parameters that I'm expecting? So I'm de um, delegating more 
most of the, the, the logics to Spring. I don't care about these things. Spring can handle them for me, and it will work. The core line that I need is just the, the image reader. So giving it a URL, the library is getting metadata from that image. That was the library is doing. Uh, to build up my image, that's all that I need. So if you see, um, with you, as you do with Maven, I'm just doing a clean build, and then I'm building the image. If you see here, I'm not spe uh, specifying any file, but I told you that Docker is using a Docker file to build the image. If you are using st sticking with the defaults, you are getting Docker is reading, Docker is looking for a Docker file in your directory. So if you find it, cool, it's using it. So I'm building the image called metadata version 100, and then I'm running the image. Those are the three comments that I'm running. This is the, it's not accelerated, it's actually, this is the speed that took to compile the application and build the container. Of course, I'm also running my tests. I want to be sure that it's working. Uh, if you saw something, I'm using a library. Of course, I'm not running from scratch. Uh, should I have finished? With, okay. This is the application running. You saw, it, now it's running in the container. So I just built a microservice that is running, it's working, I'll show you how it's working. It's doing a lot of stuff, that, that's fine. It's working. It took 16 seconds to run the application and uh, set all the stuff that it needed. It was a bit slow, but that's fine. What I used to, to run the tests, it's Spock. Spock is a library written for Groovy that lets you run a lot of tests with lo uh, less efforts, almost nothing. So actually, what I can do, it's running uh, well, this is actually the test that it's running. Uh, the, the cool thing is that it's for me, actually, is you can use, well, in uh, uh, that's Groovy, you can use strings as your method name. So if you see, it's easy to read and understand what this test is doing. I'm use also using these labels, tags and address. Where, uh, where those labels come from? I'll show you in a minute. But what I'm doing is should be well, quite easy. What, so this is the controller that I built. I'm building the, I'm getting the image from somewhere that I defined in my test. And then the application is checking that the metadata that I got are exactly the one that I expect. If you see here, this is my where, looks like a table. It's not formatted very, very well. But actually, you just define the, the labels, and then you get the, the data from the, the test gets the data from this table. So actually, when it's getting the image, this URL, it expects to get 69 metadata. Then 176, I can define as many as I want, just adding a new line with the URL, that a string, and a number of metadata that I expect. It, uh, is that complicated? Hopefully nobody says yes. Uh, so this is the, the, the wall Docker file that I told you. I'm defining here port 80, so I'm telling to Docker, look, you have to expose that port, but that also is documentation, because anybody else looking at that image, the source, actually knows that we are gonna use the port 80, so it's cool, you don't have to write, uh, you are writing documentation, and everybody else can get that. The entry point tells Docker, look, when you start the container, you have to run these commands. So I'm running Java with parameter and the, the jar file. That's just Spring Boot, the, the usual thing, nothing special. I'm copying the jar file that is in the directory where I'm running the Docker, Docker, Docker build. 
somewhere that is in this case slash data slash metadata dot jar that same path that I'm using on the command. What you need to know is that when you run the Docker build, Docker is loading the whole content of your directory, directory where you're running the command, into a cache. So it's a temporary file system that Docker is using to build your image. You can remove stuff from there. You cannot load resources from outside that directory. You cannot use uh, symbolic links, links if you're using Linux to load that data. Those data, those files must be in that directory. No exception. There is something that uh, I think I believe that is tricky about uh, Docker. Many people had issue with that, so I want to tell you which one. Here I could have used a slash before the, the, na the file name, where this file will be picked from. Is not the root of my system, but actually it's the root of the directory where I'm running Docker build. So I cannot use something like slash opt slash uh, metadata dot jar and expect that that, that that jar file is where I compiled it outside the Docker image. But usually I do not use the, the trailing sl tra uh, slash to avoid confusion to other people that may think, oh look, this comes from somewhere else. If you do it, Docker doesn't care, it will use it. Um, Any questions so far? That's cool. Do you want to see the application running? OK, guys, it's embarrassing for me. I can't find the application. I promise to. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, so I don't want to waste your time now. So I published the URL for the for sources of the application, so you can run it yourself. I uh, will also provide the image, so you can prove that if it's running on my computer, well, it's not running, but you know that we will. It's on, also going to run on your computer. If you have any issue or problem with the application, just drop me a message uh, on Twitter or any social network, and I will help you to, to download that. I'm so sorry for that, sorry. Um, that, that's embarrassing. <laughs> uh, so actually, when I started, the, the Docker path uh, was looked like a long path, something, a lot of stuff to do, and actually had to learn a lot of stuff. Uh, if you're not using yet Docker, probably you have to do the same path. But still, when you get to a point that say, you, uh, you're cool, it's working, uh, then you will see that something is still missing. Uh, maybe you are prone to add more function to your image. Don't do that, please. Because then at some point, you will get to the monolith. We, we want to stay away from monoliths. So we want to build microservices. You can build images on top of others. Uh, one of the benefits that you can, uh, the problem when you're building, the, we are putting a lot of stuff in your image, is that at some point, something will crack. At some point, some point will, something will break. And then it will be problem for you to upgrade that application. It will take you much more time. Usually what I want to do with the microservice is if I want to change something, it may take me 10 minutes or maybe less to upgrade that stuff and it will work. If you are building too many things in the same image, you are getting something like the Leaning Tower. Hopefully it will not fall down, but it's still a lot of problems. What you can do with Docker actually uh, it's suppose that you have an application that is running fine, uh, and then at some point somebody says, "Look, I need another library, uh, or I need to set a new parameter." You don't want to rebuild your image for any reason. That's fine. What you can do, you can just build another image that is using the previous image and adding that file. If you want to upgrade the application and if you saw when you are running the upgrade, you know when you're running apt get update, you're getting the updates. Sometimes a new library is not working with your environment. That's fine, it's, we can understand that. So we don't want to upgrade that things. We want to still have the same library, same version, everything the same that were in production. Maybe let's say that there is, you, you find a bug, it's a huge bug, 
And it will take you a lot of time to verify that all the dependencies will still work in your environment. You don't want to do that. But you have tests that a new jar file or your file or work file is working. You have run all your tests. So the only thing that is different is the work file. What we can do? Just use us from the previous image and then copy the new work file. We just made a new version of our application <coughs> with a single line of, well, two lines of commands that we run with the same dependencies. When I told you that we want to share the libraries, the images with the registry, it's that because if I'm running the image, building the image on my computer, and then he's running on his computer, we got two different images. Probably the, the, the um, dependencies are the same, but we are not sure. That's that point we get what we used to leave previously, that we build with different scenarios, different system, different configuration. Maybe I'm using the stable database and he's using the beta. That's fine. He may do that, but then we, I don't want to go in production with something that is beta. I want stable things. So that's why I'm going to use the registry to share my images with everybody. He can do his tests and compare using different labels, different versioning. That's fine. It will work. Um, at some point, Docker is, uh, is using experimental features. To use them, you have to define this file in your directory. Hopefully, you, are not, uh, you don't have to do that often. But if that happens, you can just use that, that thing. I actually have on my machine all the time. Because uh, I'm using them and testing them. Sometimes I'm. Uh, the good thing is that Docker is not using something experimental if you are not telling it to do it. So actually, if you're just running the commands that are stable, it will use the stable version. That's fine. So it won't break things. But OK, we run the image. Uh, it's going to work. But what we want to run now is we have a microservice. So why don't running hundreds of the same services so we can spread them all over our server farm. So we can have, we have few CPU, but if you, we can run 100 times the same application, we have so something like 100 CPU. They may be cheap, and we can then run them. Do you want to do that manually? I don't. I hope that nobody of you won't do that. So we're using orchestration. There are some tools that, some applications that are doing the hard job for us. So actually, uh, now we are going to see them. What the orchestrator say, does is running as many uh, instances that you want. How many you decide? There may be a static number, but you may also decide to run them uh, as you need. So you realize that your application, actually the orchestrator do that for you, that your application is, is running out of resources. It just starts a new instance, or 10 new instances. And then you can uh, split the load of your application on those more instances. When you don't need them anymore, you can shut down them and continue to working without using extra resources. The, actually, there are three, at the moment, three major differences. Uh, there is Docker Swarm that is super easy to use. I'll um, suggest you to give a look. You can run your machine. It's very, very easy. Um, it uses manager that decide where to run which image. And then there are workers that actually are the machines or the instances where the image is running. How to communicate between them, it's all done by the worker. So you don't care about what's happening in you may be interested, but you don't care to know what it's doing to have your system working. Another system is Mesos that is actually doing the same structure, same names. Uh, so cool. Um, it's a good alternative. Requires a bit more configuration time. Does something more uh, rather than Swarm. And last option is Kubernetes. Uh, Changed names, master, and nodes. Actually, does the same things. Kubernetes requires more configuration. Now they are improving, uh, so it may be easy. Kubernetes does a lot of stuff. Actually, I prefer it over them. Actually, I'm not you only, the only one preferring it. 43% uh, of the companies are using Kubernetes at the moment, uh, while only 70% is using the, the Docker Swarm. Thirty-two percent of the companies in the world actually this year plan to use half million dollars to spend half a million dollars to use Docker in their application. It's a lot of money, uh, and those are big, big companies. Uh, 
what I suggest to you is actually to be a bit part in your work. So sometimes you have to try things and push to use Docker, to move to, to microservices. Uh, we all know that are good things. Not everybody in the company knows that. So sometimes you have to do a lot of work to convince other stakeholders that it's working. But if you can run an application in a few seconds, not as I did that I can't find my application, but when you try that, then you can show that you can prove them, look, this is actually working. You can invite them to run on your com their computer or in, uh, if you have luck to build a, an image, a machine in, in QA or whatever, it's not your machine, and prove them, look, it is actually working, then you may convince them to use that. Um, I did it. So any question, we have some time for any question. Otherwise, I can get back to another stuff that I would like to talk with you. But it's, uh, I prefer if there are questions to, to, to listen and answer to them. Don't be shy. Yes? Databases, uh, MySQL, MongoDB, Elasticsearch, they are not really keen to run on Docker. Do uh, in your application, your microservice itself, do you run the databases also as Docker images? Uh, so the question is uh, if MySQL and uh, Mongo. MongoDB are uh, Elasticsearch, they are keen to run on images. Actually, the first Im image that I built, the monolith, was using uh, MySQL. And on my daily jobs, actually, I'm using a command, single command that builds an image on MySQL as uh, soon as I run an image that need it, needs it. So building from scratch in MySQL, but if I need data, actually, what I'm doing, when you're running an image, as I told you, Docker is, is building layers. So if you run the basic MySQL image, uh, there is one already available, but you can build yourself if you want to do something different. Docker is storing the, the data in that image. That's cool, because when may be cool. Once you delete that container, you also delete the data. But sometimes you want to keep the, 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 this, those data. So Docker gives you the ability to map that directory where you store the data, MySQL is slash var slash MySQL, somewhere in your machine. That's what I'm doing with that command. So actually, I'm mapping the, and the directory into the container uh, from, out, uh, in, from my machine, so the data stays there. When I want to run the same data, the same database, I just have to run it without having to restore the database. So let's, see that, let's think that you have uh, 10 count customers and the, their data, and then you are running your tests or your development on those data. You don't have to run backup and restore often, you just run once the image, load the data, then you can stop that container, you keep the data because you mapped on another directory, and then you can keep using it and getting back if you want. And if you want to backup, say backup your database, you just have to backup a directory. So it's very, very easy. Actually, to answer your question, you can run all the, say, all the databases that you want, and actually MySQL, Elasticsearch, and MongoDB, they are very work very nice with Docker. Yes, please. Yeah, that's a tricky question, actually. Uh, you have to decide to look at your architecture, how you want to do that. You can do it. But the issue is that cache usually takes a lot of space. If you are, anytime that Docker writes some data into the image, is a new layer. Uh, you should not run out of layers, but there are a finite number. It's quite large at the moment, but you can run out of that layers. So there are some breakage. Actually, Docker also allows you to export the image with whatever there is, and then shrink all the layers into one. And then you can keep building layers. But it's not something that I would suggest you to do that. So again, you can map the directory where you are storing the data, and then having the, the service, the microservice, the image that is reading the data, writing and uh, reading the data. At that point, you can share that data with other images, uh, a container, that's fine. So if you have something, for example, a master that's writing data, then you have a lot of slaves, you can have a lot of slaves containers that can read that data from that directory. It will work, but they will, uh, hopefully, you, uh, of course, you have to have a way to share that directory, so it's a network file system, for example, but then them all can read from that directory and provide the data. Uh, but that depends on your architecture. It's not an easy question to, to do. I don't know if it's clear 
or, or not? Yeah, actually. Yeah, go on. We have a use case where we are trying to build a distributed file system for uh, Lucy. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking whether we can use Docker to basically. <coughs> you can. I did it. Uh, So actually, the question is, do, can you have images, containers, to use a shared file system to get data from, for as Lucene as they are running? Is that the question, yeah. the, con the scenario? Yeah, you can do that. It's, um, that's why I, s I told you that you ha must have one instance that is writing and all, all others that are only reading it. Because otherwise, you, can, you will break your index. Uh, that's not something that you want to do. Uh, it, it's doable. I'm not sure that I will use the architecture in that way. I will have to do, uh, I will suggest to do some more changes, uh, rethink about your application. Because then you have the latency that uh, belongs to the network connectivity because you are sharing that director on the network. So probably what I will do is having different uh, services that are looking or indexing s parts of the data and then you could look at them and query them to get back the, uh, the, in the indices. Uh, so it's something that more or less like Elasticsearch is doing. Uh, I don't know if that helps you, will it may help you. Uh, any other question? Okay, cool, because we ran out of time, but just in time. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming.